All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. This is Left Think Books welcomes acclaimed Forward Prize winner, novelist, and poet, Kai Miller, who will discuss his new book, Things I Have Withheld. Miller tonight will be in conversation with award-winning poet and author, Rajiv Mohavir. Left Bank Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the supporters of Kai and Rajiv, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. We offer curbside pickup and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world even. We are very excited to have our doors open to the public, and you will find both of these books on our shelves. Uh, today is the book birthday for Things I Have Withheld, so it is available now and the website will be updated and we'll list it as on our shelves now. And we are very happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoy this event and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing a copy for you or for all of your friends at left-bank.com. Purchasing a copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating and it allows us to keep this event series going. So thank you so much for your support. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, towards the end of the event. So you can type your questions as a comment at any point in time, and we will get to those at the end of the hour. And be sure to follow Left Think Books on Facebook and YouTube to be, to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events. Now, about tonight's book, Things I Have Withheld. In a deeply moving, critical, and lyrical collection of interconnected essays, award-winning writer Kai Miller explores the silences in which so many important things are kept. Miller examines the experience of discrimination through this silence and what it means to breach it to risk words, to risk truth, and through the body and the histories those bodies inherit. The crimes that haunt them and how the meanings of our bodies can shift as we move through the world by carry, uh, variously assuming privilege and victimhood. Through the letters to James Baldwin, encounters with Soka, Carnival, family secrets, love affairs, questions of aesthetics, and more, Miller powerfully and imaginatively recounts everyday acts of racism and prejudice from a Black, male, queer perspective. An almost disarmingly personal collection, Kai dissects his experiences in Jamaica and Britain, working as an artist and, in, and intellectual, making friends and lovers, discovering the possibilities of music and dance, literary criticism, culture, and storytelling. With both the epigrammic concision and conversational cadence of his poetry and novels, Things I Have Withheld is a great artistic achievement, a work of innovation and beauty which challenges us to interrogate what seems unsayable, as, our, as well as our actions, defense mechanisms, imaginations, and interactions, and those of the world around us. Left Bank Books' own Jeff says, this book is tender and magnificent, an expression of the thoughts and feelings we rarely share about race, gender, and nationality from a poet of incredible skill. It is a Bomb Editor's Magazine, Bomb Magazine Editor's Choice. They say it is reverent and forthright. Publishers Weekly in a Starter Review says in, entrancing. Miller vividly depicts the ways colonialism, racism, homophobia, and privilege have shaped his life. Sharp as blades, his words cut to the core. And Deshaun Winslow, the author of In West Mills, says, Miller's storytelling is impeccable, and his verse is arresting and beautiful. Things I Have Withheld is a remarkable contribution to literature. <clears throat> and now about tonight's speakers. Kai Miller is a Jamaican poet, essayist, and novelist, shortlisted for the Costa Poetry Award and winner of the prestigious Forward Poetry Prize for his collection, the, Car the Cartographer Tries to Map a Way to Zion. His story collection, Fear of Stones, was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Book, and his most recent novel, August Town, was a finalist for the Penn Open Book Award and several other awards. In 2010, the Institute of Jamaica awarded him the Silver Musgrave Medal 
for his contributions to literature, and in 2018, he was awarded the Anthony Sag Sabga Medal for Arts and Letters. He has taught at universities of Glasgow, Royal Holloway, and Exeter, and in 2019, he was the Ida Beam Distinguished Distinguished Visiting Professor to the University of Iowa. And tonight, he will be in conversation with Rajiv Mohabir. An immigrant to the United States, he is the author of The Cowherd's, Shun the Cowherd's, Cowherd's Son, Sorry, winner of the 2015 Kundman Prize, Eric Hoffer Honorable Mention 2018, and The Taxidermist Cut from Four-Way Books, winner of the Four-Way Books Intro to Poetry Prize, finalist for the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry in 2017, and the translator of I Even Regret Night, Holy Songs of Dim Dimara Dimarara, sorry, which received a Penheim Translation Fund Grant Award. His memoir, Anti-Man, received Reckless Books' New Immigrant Writing Prize, he received his PhD in English from the University of Hawaii, Manoa, and his MFA in poetry from Queens College, CUNY. Currently, he is an assistant professor of poetry in the MFA program at Emerson College, and he lives in the Boston area. And now, without further ado, if you would please help me in welcoming our fantastic guests for the evening, we have Kai Miller and Rajiv Mohadir. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for the beautiful introduction, Shane. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so excited for this conversation, for this event. This has been a staff uh, favorite event that everyone is very excited about. So I'm so excited for the conversation. Yes, hello. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to, that I get to talk to you tonight, Kai. And thank you, Shane, for organizing this and the folks at Left Banks, Left, Left Bank Books. Um, so shall we just jump right in? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Let's, it's been so long since we've had a chance to talk, so I'm excited about this as well. Yeah, great, wonderful. And congratulations, you know, having your book out um, right now is quite an accomplishment, especially this time of huge change and transition, you know, nationally and internationally. This pandemic has changed the face of what our readings can look like. Um, and one of the things that I'm glad about is the fact that I get to be in conversation with you tonight, which oh, is yeah. a personal honor for uh, for me. So thank you. Um, and it also like the way literature is being disseminated is and, and consumed is also being changed at the moment. Um, and you are also very close to uh, a geographical transition right now. Um, in right. The just moved, uh, uh, and I'll let you talk about that in a minute. And I'm so excited to have you so much more closer to me. Um, and of course, uh, what what that means, uh, you know, in in uh, being in Miami, I'm from Florida or grew up part in Florida. So yes, I realized. Yeah, yeah, it's a place I return to often. But anyway, let's get into the book. I mean, the book does, and it it it, it sees you in the UK, it sees you in the United States, in Jamaica, it sees you in Trinidad, Ghana, and Kenya. And all of these places are important to the fabric of the book and the realizations that Kai Miller as narrator um, uh, has, um, you know, and Kai Miller na as narrator and thinker and writer. Um, and it resonates with me, this idea of having multiple belongings, which is one of these great, one of the great strengths of this book. Um, I was wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about how you see geography changing your writing or how place and wrote and and writing are related to you or how do you relate place and writing together i suppose <clears throat> oh well, um that is uh, that can be such a hard question to to answer because it, it's strange oh, the only only since you you mentioned that do i realize how okay so on one hand place is is has always been central for a long time to my writing, certainly to my poetry. Um, and place is something that I, I think I relentlessly theorize or, or try to work out just how place becomes place, right? Um, that, that moment when a space is intruded on by humans and we give it a name and we give it a story and we give it a, and, becomes, and it becomes place. What, and then that place turns around and begins to shape other people who come out of it. Um, that that process has been 
just endlessly fascinating to me um, for, for a long time. And it's, it, it's been the main subject of, of, of my poetry. So that, that interaction between place and people and writing is so, is so intimate. Uh, and yet in another way, I, I'm not sure that's the exploration that's happening in this collection of essays, right? So I, I, I think that that's a moment of being thrown, like, oh, place has always been important, but how am I thinking through place in this book? Which I think is, is you know, not as theoretical, um, or not the same kind of theory that I'm attaching to it. And I think for this book, it's it, it's it's something that I say in one of the essays that I am always looking for a place where my body raises no questions, where my body is not commented on. And what place is that? Uh, and that's an interesting search, right? Like just to be in a world where your body, I mean, I, I guess just living in this body as a black male, tall, big, uh, that becomes a, a, a profound longing to be in a place where your body does not raise anxiety. And I think throughout all of those, through, throughout all those journeys in the book, going to Iraq, going, uh, you know, back home to Jamaica, where, you know, because of the queerness, my body raises other kinds of questions, right? Or going to Trinidad, or going to, finally going to all these places in Africa where you think, oh my God, I'm, there must be a sense of belonging here and not quite finding it. I think that was my fascination with place. And after a while, it, it was also trying to sort through all those different meanings that my body produced in these different places in the world. Um, which is always, you know, slightly different. And I think I just wanted to explore that and explore that journey, but that journey of, of multiple meanings that a single body can produce. Uh, does that make any sense? <laughs> oh, that makes oh. Really sense. I mean, I think, I mean, like, I think the, book like, the kind of uh, uh, subconscious feeling that arises, you know, through the conversation um, between the essays is that... Right. Um, like that thinking through um, the constructions of race in these various national spaces. And like you're saying, where do you fit in? Where do you stay up? Um, and like, it's interesting because I see this as kind of shaping a global perspective of, um, uh, I'm gonna have to put in that I'm trying to hear a bit of an echo, so excuse me. Okay. Um, Okay, um, the kind of public perspective on the, the way black and like blackness and belonging. So I if you could talk a little bit about that, like, uh, you know, um, what is there, is there a perspective that your, your own global positioning allows you to kind of understand in a way that lends difference to the kind of uh, blacknesses that we're interpreting in the United States in this body that is precarious in ways, but then also as perceived threat. Okay, um, I, I think I got most of that. Um, the, the first part was a little bit jumbled. Uh, actually, do you want me to just say, say the first part again, just so that I'm sure I got, I got your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sorry if uh, this, uh, it's a brand new computer too. So. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, uh, so much of your book deals with race and the supp suppositions yeah. on the black body that I right. feel like nation affects, you know, your being. Um, mm -hmm. What about the constructions of race that are nationally based and how has this shaped your own global perspective on blackness and racial belonging? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I I guess for me, the most fascinating thing has been um, realizing how black, I, I, I love that you pluralize black, right? Like blacknesses. Um, and, and I think that's just, um, that would be a perspective that almost any, you know, brown body that, I have to say this carefully, but I feel that the brown body that is not from America or Britain is profoundly conscious of that. Um, because as, as we work through our 
what blackness means. Um, there's something so powerful about the space and, and it, that is so powerful about this present space that we're in, but that can dominate that discussion. And that can say, this is the definition of blackness. But as you move through the world, you realize, wow, it, it is so much more multiple. And blackness doesn't mean the same thing everywhere. Um, whiteness doesn't mean the same thing everywhere. Um, now, my body is interesting because my body can only be, or I, or I think, would only ever be racialized as black. Um, but my friends who live in other kinds of bodies um, move in and out of race. And that it's, it's been fascinating sharing their journeys with them, going that, oh, in this space, I am black. In this space, this country does not acknowledge me as black. This country racializes me as this. And because race is not, race is not biological, right? That race is, is a social construction. We all know this. Um, it's been humbling to accept that, that, that though I might want to say no, but you're black, they're not, they're not in this space. And, and I think that the book also wanted to journey through some of those, or to take some of those journeys through the bodies, especially the racially ambiguous body and what it means for them to journey in and out of different racial constructions. And what does that mean for them? Um, and you know, just to be, to be humble to that for, for a moment, rather than insisting that you will only mean this racially, when that, that's just not true to their experiences in the world. That's particularly resonant for me on, in, on two valences here in this in this book, uh, you know, things I've withheld. Um, you know, when Kai Miller, I mean, I'm talking about Kai Miller, the character, or not the character, but the, uh, the essay, um, you know, when you go to Kenya, um, and people say karibu in a kind of uh, welcome. And yeah. how do you hear that as a, like, oh, yes, oh, yes. Sir. You're right. Um, you know, and this, 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 yeah, <laughs> that points something to, to, to me as well, as well as the story about um, going to um, hear the Nairobi Noir um, launch where, you know, the question is asked to the audience, well, who here in Kenya you know, likes the police. Um, and the one hand that goes up, everyone in, in is an acknowledgement that hand is white, who, um, you know, trusts and, and respects the police, which I, I think is also this profound moment of like, um, you know, recognition of structures and how yeah. um, racialization had, happens in those patterns. Right, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, that was fascinating. So, yeah. So, you know, so the big thing as well is, you know, I think one of the things I wanted to pay attention to were, you know, lots of the differences that we don't pay attention. But when those echoes happen and they happen profoundly and then the meaning becomes the same and you recognize, oh, wow, now this, this right here is the same meaning and we'll recognize it everywhere. We recognize in so many places why that one hand, that trusted authority, that trusted a kind of brutality and it ultimately trusted a kind of history that was so wrong, why that hand was racialized as white, you know? Um, and yeah, so, so 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 much of it is is me working through those sadnesses as well, you know, like, oh wow, I, I didn't want to have that echo right now, but it's there and it's powerful. Wow. Yeah, like I hear that and like being open to that sadness as well in this process. That's that's really intense. Um, and I think it's it, it's a strength here. You know, um, I, I think Shane mentioned the vulnerability and I, I'll underscore the vulnerability of the, uh, the way that you narrate these essays and these stories there. It's real. Um, I, I can I have a, a sense of really plumbing the emotional kind of depth. Um, there's so much of the content of this book that I admire. I want to switch a little bit to talking about form and, you know, these other kinds of other mm -hmm. stuff because I think yeah. it's important to have a good balance. And I'm going to return to, like, uh, the questions of content around languages and language. Yeah. Um, but I, you are you write in all of the genres ever. Um, <laughs> in fact, maybe, maybe not graphic novel, but when you do, yeah. I'm not going to be surprised. Um, <laughs> and it'll probably win multiple awards, Kai. Um, but I, I came to know of your work uh, through your poetry, um, which your poems are arresting to me and so realized in line and voice. 
Um, your fiction has garnered you much acclaim and awards, and your essays came highly recommended to me by uh, Esther Figueroa, Figgy, uh, when I was a graduate student. Um, and I'm so in love with your dexterity and the ways that you carry poetry throughout all of your work. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your relationship to how the work comes to you. Um, how do you know when something wants to be a poem or an essay or a fiction? Well, um, I, I think that's become easier for me now. Um, you know, that, 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 a lot of that is, is, is discipline. A lot of that is knowing or having a sense of what the problems of the work are going to be and might be. Uh, because the problems in these genres are very different, right? Um, the problems of fiction are extremely different to the problems of poetry. Um, and I think if moving between those genres, I have to know who I am or who I'm going to be to fix those problems when they come. So, so, so in one sense, it's easy, um, you know, if, yeah. If the exploration that I want to make is, sorry, my phone has been pinging out, turn that down. Um, but I know that if the exploration that I want to make is is lyrical, like what what I want to do is I want to live with this word and the music of this word, and I don't necessarily want to tell you a story. I want to, I want to plumb, I want to plumb this lyrically. Um, you know, it's just very obviously a a, a poem. Um, there is no story in it. There is no narrative in it. Um, the the impulse to tell a story is, is just very different. It's and, and I, I think this is the strange thing. Though I though my strongest muscle for a while probably has been poetry. Um, I think of myself primarily as a storyteller. Like I just I really just want to sit down and tell you a story uh, all the time. Um, my friends get annoyed by that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so that, that that's a very different impulse. Um, but you know, it's it's narrative, it's story. It's that I I relish in that telling. I, I relish in withholding that one detail until the right moment, and then that changes everything. You know, that's um, and of and of course with with the essay that that's me at my most um, almost finger waving. The world is awful. I need to. <laughs> Uh, even though you try to suppress these things and transform it into something else, I know that those initial impulses lead to those different genres. Um, and also, I think that when I know what it is I want to say, again, it's coming back to what is going to the pro what is going to be the problem in this. And if the problem is going to be narrative, then I know this is fiction. And when I come across those problems, I have to be the fiction writer to solve it or the poet to solve it. Those are the only moments when I'm very strict about who I am. I, I move across genres, but when there's a problem, then I am only the thing I am writing. Wow. I feel, well, I think, well, this, what you're, what you're saying is an entire, like, um, you know, course on how to be a writer, you know, to, to kind of like abandon the idea of like uh, being just in one track, for example, uh, you know, being al allowing the multiplicity. I like what you said about problems of fiction are not are different from the problems of poetry. Um, yeah. And you know, you begin you begin this essay with this uh, wonderful with this, this collection of essays with this wonderful poem that um, I find myself returning to after reading the essays um, several times. Um, and uh, I really, I really see what you're saying here in terms of the way things are solved and the way things are not solved. And uh, thank you, thank you for that. Um, and I, you know, and I'm even noticing that you like to play with form even within a received understanding of genre. So, for example, what a, what an essay can do for you um, has some dexterity. Is my is my sound kind of funky to you again? No, 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 no. You're you're perfect. You're great. Okay, good. Because I'm hearing this echo in my ear. So, oh, no. um, what I did last time is I took out the the earphone. Anyway, so if that happens, uh, but anyway, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the forms that the essays take for, I mean, you know, the folks who are who are listening and watching, um, you know, because some of them are letters. The book is bookended um, by letters to James Baldwin, um, and there are stories within stories and narrations within stories, um, and such a cast of voices. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those aesthetic decisions. 
Yeah, uh, and and that's hard because so many of them are instinctive, right? Um, you know, I mean, so, so so yeah, this was this this became an incredibly playful collection to write. Um, but again, I I think ultimately, right? Um, for the essay, it is it is an idea that I want to journey through, and I want to explore the ends of this idea. And then the form become can become multiple. So an essay like um, Mr. Brown, uh, Mrs. White, and Miss Black. Every tool of that essay is fiction, right? You know, um, but the impulse of that is um, so. Oftentimes, to, to explain that, oftentimes in Jamaica we say, and actually across the Caribbean, but let's focus on Jamaica. Um, oftentimes in Jamaica, it's said, there is no race problem here. There's only a class problem. So racism doesn't exist in Jamaica. Only, only classism exists. And so I thought, to explore that idea, I would want to have three people who belong to three racial categories. And I don't want class to be between them. I want them, I want to flatten class and have them all come from the same place. So they have to live on the same street. They have to belong to the same socioeconomic group. And that's the impulse. Now, now I know what I have to do to explore this idea. But, there, but thereafter it becomes, it becomes fiction. It becomes, let me rest in each of these characters' mind and just let that mind run. But the impulse behind it is that there is an idea that I want to explore. I want to explore what race means if class isn't an issue. Um, and so in my mind, it's still an essay, even though all the technique of it is fiction. Yeah, it sounds like it's like such an experiment. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I, I thought my editors would go, no, this doesn't belong. And, and they loved it. And then, of course, um, Granta picked it up as the essay they wanted to publish. And so I was... I was really relieved, but surprised um, that that people were so willing to go along with these experiments in form. Yeah, I mean, and they and they, and the resonance between these essays um, also produces such a, a wonderful effect for the reader. And like the construction of the book is, you know, I'm I'm clinging to the book from uh, one essay to another. Like, okay, what's what? How else is this going to resonate in this next essay? So this is wonderful. Um, I. Um, I'm having, um, are, and, and you're, the echo is not coming through for you at all, right? Because what I'll ask you to do now is if you could pick maybe like two pages of the of your favorite essay or the most, maybe the most troubling essay uh, or <laughs> the essay that brings you the most joy or that mires through um, that sadness. And if you could give the, the listeners and the readers um, uh, and the watchers just a little bit of a taste of that. Okay, um, I, I will just pick up the book and I haven't decided what bits are readable yet, but okay, I will, yeah, I'll just read to James Baldwin. Um, I'll, I'll read one of those or part of one of those letters um, because I think a lot of the collection came together when, when I wrote that. So here is, here is a bit of one of my letters to James Baldwin. Dear James, it is the body that I wish to write about. These soft houses in which we live and in which we move and from which we can never migrate except by dying. I want, I want to write about our bodies and what they mean and how they mean and how those meanings shift even as our bodies move throughout the world, throughout time and space. I do not often like to think about my own body or even to look at it. Left to itself, my body relishes in fatness and a general lack of definition. At the present moment, my body is hard and muscled because I have been swimming and going to the gym and running and trying hard to undo the things that my body would rather do. I look in the mirror now and wonder how long this new shape will last. I do not like to talk about my body because I might have to talk about its weight or else the weight of my insecurities, but I must talk about it because it has meant so many things in so many places. At an immigration desk in Iraq before boarding the plane that will take me away, 
I am pointed towards a small room. I cannot remember much about that room now. If there were windows or if there was a ceiling fan, its slow blades, <clears throat> sorry, its slow blades uselessly stirring the warm air. This is what comes to mind now, a windowless room and a useless ceiling fan, though I am not confident in the memory. In the small room, I am ordered to take off all my clothes. I fear that they will put on latex gloves, that they will put a finger inside my body searching for drugs. They will not find any. I wonder when it was that Iraq became a popular departure point for drug mules, but I do not wonder what it is about my body that has aroused suspicion. I am used to it. I am used to being pointed to small rooms. I am used to being interrogated again and again and again, but I've never been asked to strip before. I stand there with my trousers and my underwear pooled around my ankles. I am aware of the pudginess of my belly, aware of my penis, unimpressive in its flaccidity, aware of a bead of sweat that has escaped the pit of my arm and is now running down my side. They sit, three men in uniform, and silently observe my body. And suddenly, this does not surprise me either. Wow, yeah, thank you, thank you for reading that. Um, such vulnerability um, and moments where, you know, you are and were at the mercy of this kind of external power. Um, it just, it's so arresting when we come up against these occurrences again and again, um, and the way that the racists aren't talked about, but race absolutely is. And I think that was like such a wonderful uh, way of framing um, the, the the precarity of a body that is read as threat in space. So thank you, thank you so much for this. It's been so uh, uh, wonderful. Well, wonderful is a hard word to say, but it's been so. It's been so. Um, I feel as though my heart has opened um, from reading this book, and that's like a, a gift that you've given to me. So thank you. Um, and there's so many moments in this essay collection I just adore. And I have so many questions for you. I, I'm hoping that I can get through the most of them before we open it up to question and answers. From right. um, but, you know, one of the things that I'm also taken by, taken by is the essay, The Old Black Woman Who Sat in the Corner, in which you tell the family story that not even many people in your family knew. Right, yeah. Uh, and that you write grandmothers. And that's my own personal fascination. I love grandmother writing. Um, yeah, and, I mean, uh, I, I, I started your book, by the way, which, you know, it's it's so wonderful, like that relationship with you and your Ashi. So, yeah, so yes, so, so, so immediately I was thinking about that, that relationship. Yeah, when I was reading yours, I was like, oh my God, this is, I, I'm gonna have to ask a question about this because, you yeah. know, um, I was wondering about like uh, the, the the stakes for you. Um, you know, to write these stories about your family. Um, you know, what is, uh, where do you find yourself on the scale of how much is too much and how much is enough? Every, an every essay has a different answer. Um, I, think, I think I take strange comfort in the thought, which may, which may not be true, right? But it's just a thought that I think family tends to be so uh, kind of wonderful but patronizing that they'll never read what I write, uh, which is always a great relief, right? So you just think, ah, if you want to keep a secret from your family, you just put it in a book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Sorry, there's so many things I'm writing down but that you're saying. Um, <laughs> But respect for me, I mean, if like the, the, the impulse in any essay is never to, to hurt or to, you know, yeah, that, 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 is, that is never the impulse. If it, is, if it is a truth and if I am respecting you with enough nobility, even though I'm working through some, something that's very difficult, um, I think I can allow myself to explore that. Um, and, and similar to some of the choices, I 
that, that you seem to be talking about at the beginning of Anti Man since I read since I read the beginning. It's um, I, I don't remember how you put it, but it was so beautiful that that we have we have a duty to the truth, um, but almost we have a duty not to cause undue hurt as well. Um, and you know, so you you absolutely were wrestling with these kind of. So when do we change names? When do we disguise people? Um, and I think those those just have to be instinctive choices that you make, essay to essay, memoir to memoir, poem to poem. Um, how much do I withhold still? How much do I reveal? I guess that that becomes one of the interesting things about a book like this. Things I have withheld. There are still so many things you have to withhold. Yeah. 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 There's so many truths, even though their truths are going to be damaging. Right, you know, I mean, to people being like thinking about how to balance the humors of, you know, um, this 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 kind of responsibility, um, and I I love the, the 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 writing of your family is so tender, uh, and that moment is 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 particularly amazing, um, you know, uh, or at least uh, caught me uh, where I live uh, emotionally uh, in this profound in this profoundly generous act of um, showing what maternal love could be and, uh, you know, filial love um, yeah. could be and is. Um, you know, there's another, th this brings me to another point of like, uh, you know, there seems to be the uh, a Kai Miller, like your voice that exists as a perpetual observer. Um, maybe this is a convention of essay and nonfiction, um, but it reminds me of the disconnected or, or the, the connected disconnect of the photographer who's like documenting an event, right? right. Um, similarly, the Kai, the, the narrator uh, for, for the reader acts sometimes as this kind of lens um, that uh, that's involved, but also separate. Um, and what can you make of this outsideness? Uh, you know, is there a queerness to it too? Um, you know, whether it's like being on the outside, um, you know, of uh, the, the Kai Miller who's whispering to us from that family meeting uh, where the grandmother is talking or, you know, in other places, um, you know, is it a kind of interpretation to grant the reader access to that complicated, uh, all of the complicated questions that you're really grappling with here? Yeah, um, I think you finally found a question that stumped me, which, which seems kind of simple, right? But I genuinely don't know. Um, I've always thought that that outsider um, observer thing is just the it's it's the disposition of the writer. It's that we we always live in that in that world in that space. We we always live even while we observe ourselves living. And you know, like I, I don't know if that's so much queer or if it's just writerly. Um, but yet my sister has exactly that same kind of consciousness. Um, you know, so, so writing for me is like growing up in the family is oftentimes just being with my sister and sitting in the background and observing or coming back later at night and like, how did you make sense of that? Which is not to say that we weren't in the moment and involved in the moment, but we were also taking notes. Uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure where that comes from. I, I, I just assumed it was it, it was a writerly stance. Uh, but it is tiring and it is, I think it, it's just been relentlessly my life. I, I spent so much time observing and thinking and rethinking that moment, um, which is why one of the weird, uh, it's not weird at all. I mean, you've, you've mentioned it tonight, um, the vulnerability in the book, which I sometimes I'm not aware of because I think I have to tell this story and I'm involved in this story. Um, and therefore I just have to tell what happened. And then it comes out and someone says, I can't believe you revealed that. And I thought, oh, that shouldn't have been revealed or another person would, would not have revealed that. But it, it just seems natural to me because that's, that's what the story was. That's what I observed, even if I was observing myself and I have to think through all of that. I have to think through what my body meant in that moment. Um, I think the hardest, you know, you, you talk about like when we reveal things. I think the the much harder essay for me was the boys at the harbor. 
because for that one, I thought because they are so much more vulnerable, I had to have their permission and they had to read that whole essay and approve it before I published it. And, you know, that's another kind of negotiation happening. Um, but yeah, but even that whole story to think about my friendship with them and writing that through and writing my body in those spaces and writing about their vulnerability, um, that was much harder than say my family. Yeah, I see that. I, I hear the interiority that you're really exposing for the reader, um, you know, thinking through those moments of interiority where you're in those family situations. It's, it's interesting and, and quite, uh, I like the way that you say that, 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 that just might be the writerly like position. Um, mm -hmm. And then also the boys in the harbor. Now that essay is is just it's a, another great one, another great one, Kai. Um, in that you know the implication here is not just um, you know how fucked up things are around, but then also kind of like you know you get into that that vulnerability also of you know having the reader kind of have a feeling about you being like, well, you know I didn't want to answer this text right away. I, I put my phone in. I was feeling angry when I received this, and I thought like exposing that layer to the reader that actually also is an act of vulnerability like you know to what does it mean to to ourselves not have perfect politics every every moment yeah. right yeah. and like to write that down for people to read and, a, right and to be with boys that are where i am the one with power you know i'm I, i'm always the one i am the empowered one in all of those situations right um and you have to you have to work your way through that yeah uh, um, I, 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 there are, there is another question that I have for you. Two, a couple more questions, but I think we have maybe a couple more minutes before we go into the question and answer from the audience. But, um, you know, one of the like, uh, you know, I, I said to you behind the the screen, waiting to have this moment where I could like say this to you <laughs> publicly. <laughs> like, um, you have done so much in terms of uh, letting a Caribbean um, English or letting many Caribbean Englishes be. Uh, lived and breathed in your book. And I really, it's something that I really admire um, in your poetry and something that gave me space to speak in my home language and to write in my home language. And, um, you know, you talk about language use and the various Caribbean Englishes and the African Englishes um, here. And I, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit, you know, what did it mean for you to write in um, the various uh, registers of, um, you know, Jamaican English and uh, that, that you do here? Uh, I don't think that that's ever something that I've um, that has never raised any kind of anxiety in me. I, 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 um, it's always been natural. I, I just think uh, there is we each bring different things to writing. And your job is to control the language that you are putting on the page. And the kind of language that I can control, meaning I can do things with it that other people can't do, is always going to be a Caribbean English. It's not, it, it, it's, it's not even political for me, it's artistic. It's that this is what I can do that other people can't. And so therefore I am going to, I, I'm going to give myself the best hand. I'm going to deal myself the best hand. Um, the, and, and of course, I, I understand that there are political reasons why this is important to give agency, to give sound to people who are disenfranchised. But at a level for me, it is artistic. It is this, this is my kingdom. And I'm going to write from it, you know? Uh, the harder choices for this was, I think, coming to the end of the book, um, this is how we die. And because of how that essay moves, it moves to Trinidad. And I now have to use a voice that is resonant with that. Now that was hard. <laughs> that scared the bejesus out of me because that's not, it's a language that I know, I understand the sounds of it, but to put it to paper, that, that's not a language that I have that much skill to control, right? And that, that felt particularly vulnerable for me because I'm not using a language that I'm confident in. 
you know, no one can come to me and tell me that, oh, my use of Jamaican wasn't right here. You don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> Every treaty writer could come to me and say, what do you ask you doing here? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I'm sure they will. <laughs> like if, exactly, if exactly. Up, yeah. Um, but I, I uh, yeah, thank you so much for answering all my questions. And oh my God, thank you for being your generosity here, Kai. It's just, it's so moving to get to talk to you and to like having having read your, your new collection. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, we only have one question so far from the audience. So Rajiv, you might have some time for uh, some extra questions as well, but I feel like this is a great place. You asked many of the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, so thank you. Um, but we talked a little bit about code switching and I feel like before the event, and I feel like this conversation might have a little bit to do with that as well. And I'm specifically curious about the queer code switching that I'm certain that we all, um, yeah. are familiar with. Yeah. Um, and when you talked about your family reading versus not reading, uh, I'm wondering if that code switching that we have to do as queer people affected the writing of the book and if you thought like oh that's maybe just too too much for a straight audience or if you just were okay with laying it all out there all right that thing that that is really interesting uh because okay so if we go back to that essay the boys at the harbor uh and i'm talking about queer jamaica now there is a decision I made years ago um, that does that does affect that essay, and it's that the, the kind of mad the the, ex, the extremes of those code switching when you move into queer Jamaican spaces. I will never reveal that language to a straight audience, and because I think there is there is a power there. There is there is a sense of this is how we hide. Um, I just don't think it's my right to ever let people in on that that language. I think there's too much, too much vulnerability, too much of a sense of a community and a community where things are at stake if that's revealed. So, so that essay actually was interesting because if I was to say all of how they speak exactly, uh, to me that's just a political decision I'd never make. And so, some of that was tempering it to give you a sense of the queerness and the flamboyance but not to give you the actual um, vocabulary that's being used at times. And yeah, and, and, and no one would know that I was making those decisions unless you asked that question. Um, but yeah, that, that, that is a moment where I would, I would hold back. And I, I don't remember when I made that decision, but, but, it, but it's very conscious in my head um, that there are, some, there are some queer, yeah, there's some queer languages in the Caribbean or queer Creoles that I would not reveal. Thank you. Um, a question from Jeff, who I think is maybe the Jeff that works at the bookstore, um, asks, at what point did you decide to bring in James Baldwin? Did you always intend to address the book to him? No, absolutely. That, that Oddly, that came closer to the end of the book. Um, and so James, uh, Dion Brand was much more um, the person I was in conversation with, right? Uh, just because of that, that quote that starts the book, um, where she says, well, you know, where she's giving this moment of addressing a, a white audience. And she says, uh, you know, part of this speech I'm about to give is already written for that I'm a black woman speaking to a white audience is part of the text um, because race structures so many of our exchanges, personal, political, blah, blah, blah. And then she says, it means there's some things, it means there's some things that I'm about to tell you and some things that I can't tell you. And the most important things will be the things that I withhold. And that's what was running through my mind throughout the whole book. Why do we withhold things? Uh, so how did James Baldwin come in? Um, randomly, uh, because there were four essays that weren't working and they were like snippets of essays and I couldn't get them to work and I was about to throw them out. And the Manchester Book Festival asked me to do this commission. If they wanted a poem um, to James Baldwin and I could do anything that I wanted with it. And I 
thought, okay, I won't write a poem, but I'm going to take these four essays that I'm about to throw out, and I'm going to restructure them all addressed to James Baldwin. And I suddenly made them work. Uh, and then, and then the essay became much longer than those four like stumps of essays, right? Um, and I mean, it it didn't start with him, but it unlocked so many things um, because I could. I guess when you're working with a collection like this, or working on a collection like this, and it's about, you know, how do you speak about race? How do you speak about it? There, there are such fraught topics to address, right? And one of the hard things is to address them full on. And you realize there's there's such a power to overhearing something rather than having something said directly to you. And I think that was that was just a release for me that I could turn my gaze, quote unquote, away from the reader. And I could look at James Baldwin, whose body looks like mine, who is also queer, who is also black, who also grew up, you know, in this kind of Pentecostal background. There's so many resonances and I can talk to him and I'll allow you to overhear this conversation. So you don't have to feel accused. You can just listen to me speaking to someone who is, is smart and wise and, and human and, and full of love. And that was, uh, yeah, that, that unlocked a lot. So he didn't start the collection, but it, it unlocked many things for me and allowed me to finish the book. A uh, question that I have for you, uh, Rajiv, you incorporate some poetry into your book and you were both very well known for poetry, multiple award-winning uh, poets in mm -hmm. our midst. And I'm wondering if either of you were tempted to include more poetry or I, to include poetry, you, you do include some, um, but of your own poetry mostly in this for this question, in these newest books or uh, in Anti-Man or in Things I Have Withheld, um, to enlighten the text and to give, to bring both of those audiences together. I'm wondering if you were ever tempted to do that with uh, these books. I'll let you answer that, Rizzi. Um, yeah, uh, there is a lot of poetry in Antiman just because I, I wanted to structure it um, or to have the structure of it be a little echoic of the way storytelling happens in my family, um, which is like there, we start with one story and then there's a side story and then this person will, will start singing a song in Hindi uh, that they probably don't know the, the meaning to the words and then so-and-so will say something else and then there will be a joke. So I was thinking about the, the the paper and how then I could tell the story in this you know multivalent way. And for me, poetry exists in that kind of like musical aside here because some of them are literal literal transcriptions and translations of my Audrey speaking. So um, that's the the kind of space that this also and part of that book is also how I come to poetry, um, realizing that I've been in poetry. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Uh, for me in this book, um, to be honest, no, um, I wasn't tempted. But but that that probably is that kind of a much stricter line than I draw. Um, so um, and that's just the different sensibilities of writers, right? Um, so I might. Where, where is the kind of power in Anti-Man is Rajiv deciding to bring things together and mix them? I, I get so worked up about keeping things separate. Uh, and so, so my, my aesthetic just works different from Rajiv in that, right? Um, but also, I think as much as I said that th these genres are separate in my head and, and they are very separate, the act of writing an essay satisfies me in the same way as writing a poem. And so it, there's especially not the temptation to move. When I'm writing, I might write fiction and nonfiction at the same time, or fiction and poetry at the same time, but I probably wouldn't write nonfiction and poetry at the same time, because the same part of my brain is, being, is, is, is satisfied and working. Um, and so much of this, of this collection is trying to be lyrical that, um, 
yeah, I, I didn't see the need for more poetry. Um, I could see how with I feel like poetry, a lot of poetry is um, exposing vulnerability, which we spoke about earlier, and how that could very much be like your book is already very vulnerable. Um, the essays are very uh, ex exposing vulnerability. And I could see how if you were trying to write poetry and uh, essays at the same time, that it would be a lot of overwhelming. Yeah, just break down. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I ask another question? Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, Kai, like, uh, you know, um, how, because these, these essays, like you're saying, they, they, they sprang out um, independent of one another, yes? And so when it came time to laying them together into a book, uh, what was that process like for you? And what measurements did you have to do for each? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Uh, part of it was that I wrote so many more essays than these. Um, and so I never write at length, really. I'm, that's the point in me. I am, I am so concise for everything. If I write a novel and I send it to my publishers, they say, you need 100 more pages. And I go, why is it done already? And I go kicking and screaming and I go, oh. This was the first book where it was so much bigger than this. And, and therefore, the, the process of editing it was, this belongs to this conversation. This carries on from that essay. And it was finding out what was, what was this conversation about silence and the body. Um, and so, so yes, yeah, so, so after a while, it, I think I just let it happen. And then there are just moments when, when, as, as you see happening, the essays begin to echo each other, characters come back. Um, and so it, I, the book, almost, it was as if the, the 14 essays that wanted to be together after a while, they were reaching their hands around each other. And the other seven essays just kind of got booted out because the set, that those 14 essays says, we are a group, we don't really want you. <laughs> and yeah. And those seven essays are, you know, being planted in another garden, maybe, yeah, for another. Yeah, direction. very possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, and and some of them kind of belong to this book, but they were really strident, and you know, um, I, I'm not sure as generous as I could be. <laughs> um, you know, for one reason or the other, they just they just got kicked out. And but you're absolutely right. I, I think that they might belong to another collection when I can temper them some more. I want to thank both of you so much for this incredibly generous conversation, this like enlightening and beautiful conversation. And I want to remind the audience, I have both of these in my hands, but uh, Rajiv, I didn't realize that today was the pub day for uh, Cutlish as well. So uh, oh it God. is, you share a book birthday. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, so yes, both of these books are on our shelves now and available to order from Left Bank Books. We can mail anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world even. So if you do, uh, if you are not local and uh, want to have books mailed to you, we would love to be your bookstore for these books. And um, I want to thank you both for the conversation. Thank the audience for attending this evening and for uh, sharing in my experience of this event tonight. Yeah, great. Thank, Thank you so you. much for having us, Shane. Yeah, this was absolutely wonderful. The highlight of my week. <laughs> Mine too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've really been looking forward to this event for a very long time. Uh, it's really just been fantastic. So I want to say congratulations and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. you too. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.